Hello again, boys and girls, and welcome to this very special episode of Fuel the Pedal podcast. As usual, I am your host, Gabriel Martins, and as promised, today is the very first double guest episode with none other than Dr. Stuart Phillips and my good friend, colleague, and a remarkable researcher whom I truly admire, Dr. Philippe Teixeira. Bear with my excitement, but I've been really looking forward to this one. We are at episode number 8 and the topic at hand here today is a big one and one that everyone usually likes. In sports nutrition, every time we're talking about a supplement, all heads turn in your direction. It's a classic bait that still continues to get too much attention in my opinion and this is probably one of the main reasons for me to bring up this topic. And as usual, before getting into the good stuff, the latest news on cycling. And this year's edition of the Giro d'Italia is over and the winner was Richard Carapath from Movistar team who became the first Equatorian rider to win the Giro d'Italia. Italian Vincenzo Nibali from Bahrain Merida finished second with Slovenian rider Primo Roglic from team Jumbo Visma on the third place. Pascal Ackermann from Bora Ansgroha narrowly won the points classification. Giulio Ciccone from team Trek Segafredo won mountains classification after leading it through 20 of the 21 stages of this Giro d'Italia. Impressive if you ask me. And Miguel Angel Lopez from Team Astana won the Young Rider classification. The team classification was won by Movistar Team. And what else on this cycling season? Well, on the 9th of June it will be time for the 71st edition of the Criterion du Dauphiné and on the 15th of June it will be time for the Tour de Suisse, the last UCI World Tour race before the Tour de France, the most iconic race in the cycling calendar. Moving on guys! Let's get down to business here. So, branched-chain amino acids, glutamine, collagen and HMB started out as being supplements popular in the fitness world only, but quickly invaded the endurance sports as well, particularly cycling. We quite often see cyclists urging to take glutamine right after training to aid in recovery, or BCAs during training to reduce muscle damage, collagen to protect the joints or even HMB to minimize loss of fat-free mass during periods of long training sessions. To clarify and present you with the latest evidence on these supplements and their possible application to cycling and endurance sports, I had to bring these two researchers that I consider to be true experts on their fields on protein metabolism and amino acid supplementation in athletes. The vast majority of you may be already familiar with Dr. Stuart Phillips and his remarkable research work and contributions as a researcher. He is a full professor in the Department of Kinesiology and School of Medicine at McMaster University. He is a Tier 1 Canada Research Chair on Skeletal Muscle Health and Aging and he is also the Director of the Physical Activity Center of Excellence. Needless to say that he is a recipient of multiple awards including being named in the top 1% of cited scientists scientists worldwide in 2018. Stewart is a fellow of the American College of Sports Medicine, the American College of Sports Nutrition and the Canadian Academy of Health Sciences. I would probably just add that it is thanks to Dr. Stewart's research along with some of his brilliant students at McMaster University that we came to know so much more about protein metabolism, particularly in the past decade. And since we're talking about Stuart Phillips's brilliant research students, allow me to present Dr. Philippe Teixeira, who was mentored by Dr. Dr. Stuart Phillips during his PhD project while researching on several leucine metabolites. I've known Phillips since I was in my early grad years in dietetics and nutrition back in 2010 and even back then he was already showing an outstanding knowledge on all the mechanistic stuff surrounding protein metabolism and muscle protein synthesis. Philippe Teixeira is a registered nutritionist with a PhD in exercise physiology and has a keen interest in supplement research having already invested investigated and published research on several supplements such as HMB, whey, zinc and tribulus and he has an immense knowledge on the topics at hand here today. But above all, he's a Portuguese fellow just like me. So let's get into this interesting discussion. Do these supplements have a role in endurance sports, particularly cycling, or is it time to save some money? Stay tuned! Hi Stuart, welcome to the show, how are you doing? I'm doing well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it's a pleasure. 
And hello, Philippe, or should I say, Olá, Philippe, bem-vindo ao programa. How are you doing? Hi, Gabriel. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, obrigado por me teres convidado. <laughs> let's put our patriotism aside and let's switch to the universal language. So, uh, gentlemen, it's an honor to have you here on the show. I truly appreciate your time and surely our, our listeners are looking forward to hear what you both have to say about this subject. So before we start, uh, Stuart, could you please give us a little bit of info on yourself, your academic background and your research focus? Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm a professor in the Department of Kinesiology at McMaster University. Mm -hmm. uh, I've been at McMaster now for 20 years. Um, my main interests are the interaction between uh, exercise, mostly resistance exercise, so anabolic um, muscle building uh, exercise, and, um, and dietary interventions, and specifically focused on uh, more on protein than anything else. But uh, we studied lots of different things over the years and so I could probably uh, talk about uh, uh, all kinds of things. Okay, great. How about you, Philip? Could you provide us a little bit of uh, context on yourself and your academic background and research focus as well? Sure. Uh, like yourself, I'm a nutritionist. I recently obtained my PhD in exercise physiology. My research project was on leucine metabolites on performance and body composition. And I mostly lecture and do some nutritional counseling also. So that's mostly it. Uh, currently, I'm looking for my uh, spot on a postdoctoral fellowship or a professorship uh, position. Okay, that's that's great. I had the pleasure to uh, to watch uh, firsthand uh, Felipe's uh, thesis uh, dissertation defense in Portugal. Uh, it was a great moment, and we will tackle it uh, today here when we uh, when we approach the the HMB supplementation. So, just to provide a brief topic contextualization. Um, so, exercise, no matter how structured will require a period of rest to permit the body to be restored to a state where it can exercise once more. Tired athletes cannot train or compete at their highest possible level if they have not permitted themselves to properly recover their muscles. And when we talk about recovery, uh, different ideas may arise depending on whom we are talking to. Uh, to a researcher or to a sports nutritionist or dietitian, such as Felipe or me, uh, recovery means replenishing of muscle and liver glycogen as soon as possible, rehydrating, with at least the amount of fluid you've lost during exercise, as well as providing some protein to stimulate muscle protein synthesis, which will vary according to the type of athlete and nature of the exercise, of course. To an athlete, independently if he's a cyclist or a bodybuilder, recovery appears to be very associated to providing protein as fast as possible, with an evident concern of muscle protein breakdown, particularly in cyclists, which has led them to engage in supplementing with some isolated amino acids, such as glutamine or BCAs, leucine metabolites, such as HMB, and in some cases with collagen uh, peptides which have become quite trendy uh, so even though the recovery process is unquestionably necessary for the majority of sports disciplines not only during competition periods but also during hard training periods as well the evidence for the above mentioned supplements still remains somewhat questionable But the perception of recovering any athlete can be very subjective, which may lead to chronic consumption of said supplement, even if it's not having any benefit at all. These trends appear to have invaded the endurance world as well, to the point that we often see energy drinks, bars, gels, with added BCAs and glutamine. Still, given the grueling nature of cycling, it's only natural that riders and coaches seek any possible marginal gains that may aid in the recovery process, which in theory may make the difference in the next day. So, first things first, and before we get we dive into the topics at hand here today, and since we're going to be talking about supplementing with amino acids in a general way and their metabolites, let's try to provide some context here for the listeners on muscle protein metabolism in athletes. So my initial question is, uh, what has changed in the past decade on muscle protein metabolism research for athletes in a general sense, especially considering timing, fractioning, protein quality and convenience. Um, is there uh, a need to reevaluate the current protein recommendations for both resistance and endurance uh, athletes alike? Where does the current science stand here, uh, Stuart? Yeah, I, I think over the last um, definitely 20 years, I've seen a shift in people's understanding of um, what it takes to fully recover from exercise. Uh, 
Um, I like to talk about uh, in recovery three R's. Uh, it works in English. I'm not so sure about Spanish or Portuguese, but uh, rehydration, uh, refueling, and and then repair. And the repair aspect is really around protein. And so restoring either damaged structures or, uh, if you like, um, reinforcing or remodeling uh, certain connective tissue or muscle proteins, and then possibly even supporting uh, immune system health. So uh, that's where the protein aspect comes in. And I do think that we've learned uh, a little bit more about uh, post-exercise protein provision, what it can do for athletes, and um, then what might happen uh, if that were inadequate or maybe inappropriately timed. So um, for endurance athletes, I think it's just as important as it is for uh, resistance trained athletes to try and get protein uh, post-exercise, not saying that pre or during is um, you know not useful. It may be not as useful as post-exercise. But right after exercise is when our muscles are very receptive to um, receiving fuel and substrates and uh, and replenishing and getting ready for the next workout. So protein is definitely uh, part of that. And I think most of the evidence now would suggest that uh, that athletes do, in fact, have an increased requirement for protein. Okay, great. It's a great way to start. Philip, would you add anything else to this? Stu summed that up very well. Uh, timing does not seem that important. Uh, Brad Schoenfeld has a meta-analysis on this. Fractioning might be important under certain conditions, like energy restriction and uh, very stressful periods of training. Quality also might influence, in a certain manner, the hypertrophic outcomes. In convenience, well, I guess this is where protein powders really show some advantage. Main issues focusing on repair, in my view, are related with protein recommendations for endurance exercise. Some research has stemmed out of Professor Dan Moore's lab, but I would say evidence is still lacking, at least in my opinion. And to have a higher level of complexity, uh, recent research at Medicine and Science, Sports and Exercise uh, suggests that performing endurance exercise with low carbohydrate availability increases protein requirements on endurance athletes. This is the Gillen et al. paper. Uh, regarding resistant exercise training, I think all was said by Stu. I have nothing to add. That's an amazing point to bring out, Philippe, and uh, quite relevant, I think, because uh, cyclists perform a lot of sessions with reduced carbohydrate availability, uh, particularly now that we have uh, an organized framework on fuel for the work required presented by, by Dr. Sam Impey, who was here on the show. And it would be interesting to tackle this on a following uh, episode. And taking into account what you both just, uh, just said, uh, could we perhaps add a second factor which is the fact that cyclists train for a, a lot a lot of hours per day they have four hour riding sessions five hours six hour without even counting the periods that they're competing could we perhaps say that the fractioning and uh, the convenience wouldn't become more important factors here considering this, uh, this situation in particular Stuart? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, you know, with those types of schedules and that amount of time spent on the bike, then uh, clearly you're going to be looking at um, some type of feeding program if you can work it into your training schedule that uh, that fits even while you're on the bike. So uh, some of those folks would definitely be taking in uh, gels or maybe something with amino acids um, to maybe even support um, the protein requirements during the exercise bout itself. But if you're on the bike for that long, um, then feeding occasions uh, are, are far fewer than most people would have in terms of, you know, sort of breakfast, lunch and, and uh, dinner. Um, so, yeah, I, you know, it, it becomes more a, a situation of practicality and trying to fit those eating occasions in and around the workout, which makes things, uh, you know, quite a bit more difficult. Uh -huh. What would you add, Philippe? Definitely, we will oxidize amino acids under uh, prolonged endurance exercise. This has been shown by several research papers, uh, for instance, from uh, Professor uh, Gibala in 2007. So I think you will have to supplement with proteins or amino acids to compensate for this increased oxidation. You might oxidize up to 8 milligrams per kilogram hour in endurance athletes performing low-intensity exercise. 
This, however, only makes sense to me when under prolonged endurance exercise, and I don't think it would m make much of a difference when you're performing resistant exercise training in sessions of one hour. So I will leave it there. Okay, so that provides us the best context to move on to the next question and try to tackle BCA supplementations, which uh, endurance athletes seem to love, and they consume them in isolation, in a powdered form, or in a capsule form. Um, this is probably one of the most confusing supplements out there, uh, because they became very popular in the fitness world, and then they invaded the endurance sports as well. But then to add on to the confusion, we now have two position stands that have somehow different positions on them. The IOC, for example, and the, the Australian Institute of Sport uh, Framework of Supplementation. In the IOC consensus statement in which you've collaborated, Stuart, uh, if we try to search for the, the BCAs, for example, if you do control F on the document, you can't even find them. Whereas in the AIS uh, supplement framework released this present year, 2019, they are uh, in the group B, emerging scientific support deserving for the research, certain for use by ident identified individual athletes within research or clinical uh, monitoring situations. So taking into account that BCAs are currently being added, as you said, to all sorts of sports foods, such as energy bars, gels, and drinks, what are the claimed effects of supplementing with BCAs? What is the evidence out there that may or may not justify this practice in athletes seeking to increase fat-free mass or even in endurance athletes seeking to reduce exercise-induced muscle damage or uh, Uh, reduced delayed onset muscle soreness, for example. Uh, could there be any possible advantages of including BCAs in such um, sports foods, uh, Stuart? Yeah, so um, as you mentioned, uh, Gabriel, I was part of the IOC consensus uh, paper, and um, maybe most people know, know my views on BCAs. It's not surprising that you wouldn't find them in the document because I, I don't think that there's very strong evidence to suggest that they're effective. Now, and I will say this, is that I think that historically, if you look at where BCAAs came from, uh, and you go back to the 60s and 70s, and uh, there were muscle preps where muscles were taken out of animals, and they were put into a bath, and then the investigators uh, discovered that if you put branched-chain amino acids in the bath that was bathing the muscle, that the muscle became... Uh, far more, if you like, uh, anabolic, in other words, or less catabolic. And so uh, that was sort of that observation was translated over to humans. And uh, I think that people would probably anecdotally report that they get less muscle soreness if they take BCAAs. I think that most of the research out there in which branched chain amino acids have been compared to to nothing, in other words, to a placebo, a true placebo, would definitely show something Uh, that would be positive with respect to branch chains. Uh, I think the active amino acid of the three branch chains is, is really leucine. So uh, in situations where leucine and branch chains have been compared, which is almost none, my prediction would be is that you wouldn't see any difference. And similarly, um, if you look at research comparing maybe branch chains to whey protein, which again, I'm, I'm not overly uh, familiar with the literature enough to say that there are those studies, uh, people also get reductions in muscle soreness. So I don't think that there's anything particularly special to branch chains. Uh, I think it's a leucine mediated effect effect, to be really honest with you. And protein in and of itself, whey protein in particular, would be uh, just as effective. And, you know, in my opinion, since you've got all of the other essential amino acids in whey protein, um, it would probably be a, a better or, um, if you like, a, a more effective Uh, recovery strategy as compared to branch chain amino acids. So, um, you know, my broad view of the literature in this area is that they've received a lot of attention because there's probably an effect there, but it's an effect mediated by one of the three amino acids. The other two aren't particularly important. And when you look at it in, in totality, I think that whey protein would probably do uh, as good or probably even a better job. Okay, great. Philip, what would you add to this? Uh, like Stu said, it's it's better than nothing. Uh, this has been shown, for instance, on the Jackman et al. paper. But when focusing on muscle protein synthesis, BCAs will, BCAs will increase muscle protein synthesis, but to a lower extent than whey. If any effect exists between delayed onset muscle soreness or muscle damage, 
I believe it's likely leucine related. In fact, a review from Foray states that BCAAs might prevent muscle damage if it is of low to moderate intensity. Furthermore, a meta-analysis from Raimi also states that they may prevent perceived muscle pain. And also some research states they might prevent muscle damage. However, I'm not sure that preventing muscle damage is a, is a good idea. At least research from animal models has displayed some discouraging outcomes. We need to recycle amino acids, and degradation seems uh, fundamental on this regard. Uh, when it comes to perceived muscle soreness, again, uh, another paper has uh, displayed interesting results. I'm referring to the Nutrients uh, 2018 paper. Trisha van Dusseldorp, and I, I'm quoting, says this, When consuming with a diet consisting of 1.2 grams per kilogram body weight day of protein, the attenuation of muscle performance decrements or corresponding plasma creatine kinase levels are likely negligible. So, when you're consuming sufficient protein, they do not seem to further add to this topic. And there is the central fatigue hypothesis. And uh, again, a recent systematic review and meta-analysis states that there is no effect of BCAs on central fatigue, albeit uh, the authors found uh, some interesting results on blood markers. Also, this meta-analysis did not assess performance, so even that BCAAs might improve some of these blood markers, we don't, we aren't sure if this will be reflected on performance. So I believe a lot of hype around this, and if we're focusing on mTOR, then the affinities are, are all on the leucine side. Again, no advantage to having isoleucine or, or valine. So the, for my question would be, what can you get from BCAAs that you don't get from whey? Exactly, Philip. That's that's the question we should be all asking. But uh, still, regardless of that, uh, athletes are still using BCAs, uh, especially because it's one of the supplements that you assume that it's doing something, so you keep on taking it with no feedback. But yet again, uh, the particular context of endurance sports is that BCAs are in sports bars, they are in sports drinks, gels, and perhaps athletes at some point, they believe that that particular sports food has an added value because of that um i don't know should this effect in the athletes believe should be also accounted for Stuart? well i mean i i think one of the important points um that, that the folks at the ais often make and louise burke is fond of saying this that if um the athlete believes that something is going to work uh then you know you you've already gone a long way to to ensuring that it works right so um, maybe reading BCAAs on the label or seeing something like that would, would create a psychological edge. And if that's the case, then I would never say, you know, don't take that because it doesn't work. I mean, if they think it's working, then, you know, please, by all means, go ahead. Um, I, I think the, the main point would be that, uh, you know, when you when you do these studies, and as Philippe uh, quite correctly pointed out, um, with respect to central fatigue and, and these sorts of things in controlled settings, you, you don't see any, you know, where, where the athlete would ostensibly get some sort of benefit. Uh, you, you don't see any enhancement in performance. Now, you know, in, in the field where people are taking them and if, you know, I feel this, I get this and everything, then um, I, I, I can't argue uh, with that. If people feel better, then, um, you know, <laughs> what can I say? Yes, of course, that psychological edge is important to take into account. Uh, would you agree, Philip? Well, uh... The Saunders et al. paper and others have already brought this issue. So it seems taking something will increase performance. So the question is, should we use placebo groups or control groups? No question, the placebo effect is well studied and it does matter. So I, I completely agree with Stu on, on this uh, matter. We might have ruined that placebo effect for the athletes listening to this podcast right now. So diving into glutamine now, and similarly to what happens with BCAs, uh, glutamine is also added to energy bars, to gels, and to isotonic drinks, and may increase the added value perception that we were talking about. Um, and in a previous episode with Dr. Jamie Pugh from Liverpool John Morris University, we talked a bit about his research on glutamine supplementation in reducing markers of intensity intestinal permeability as a way of reducing gastrointestinal uh, symptoms during exercise. But the claims of glutamine supplementation and the reasons for athletes to consume them goes beyond this, and this supplement still remains, at least in my perception, quite popular among athletes, particularly endurance athletes. So again, what are the claims, the evidence, and possible application to athletes, particularly endurance athletes, whether if taken in isolation or added to sports? 
Stewart's Foods. Stuart. Yeah, so I, I mean, I think the um, most people are familiar with the clinical observation of people in extremely catabolic states. So maybe uh, with sepsis or burns or, or something like that in, in intensive care units that have very low levels of muscle glutamine. And then when glutamine is given to these patients, their, their muscle protein balance um, improves. And so I think, again, that that's been the clinical observation that people have then sort of taken on into the exercise realm and said, look, glutamine is uh, a lot of it's used during exercise. And to your point and to Dr. Uh, Pugh's work around enterocytes, they love glutamine. Uh, so the gut cells, you know, they, they use a lot of glutamine as fuel and it's one of the primary amino acids that they take up. So, but the evidence to sort of suggest, you know, whether that actually has any meaningful effect on muscle is actually fairly thin um, as far as humans are concerned. So again, I, I fall back and say that maybe in extreme states of training or uh, where you know gut permeability is a is a big issue, um, then there may be some good evidence for glutamine. Uh, as far as muscle is concerned, um, uh, again, it, it's really hard to to demonstrate a, an effect for the main reason that when you measure amino acid levels in a, in a muscle sample, one of the most abundant, in fact, if not the most abundant, but very very close to to taurine is uh, is glutamine. So. You simply can't take enough glutamine to get more glutamine into muscle. So taking people who are deficient and making them sufficient, as in the clinical situation, great. Uh, taking people that are sufficient, in other words, they've got enough uh, glutamine on board, uh, I don't think you can get any more glutamine into the system. Interesting. So it's not just a matter of saying, you know, glutamine is the most abundant amino acid in the muscle, so let's take glutamine. Philip, what would you add to this party? Well, uh, again, Stu uh, pretty much uh, summed it up uh, very well. The issue with glutamine on recovery, uh, in my view, stems from two papers, one from Legault in 2015 and uh, other from Waldron in, also in 2015, I believe. However, uh, we have to look into the whole body of evidence. And what do we know about glutamine? Well, we know it doesn't improve high-intensity exercise, we know it doesn't improve maximal effort in cycling. Maybe it might improve hydration. However, it has no effect on performance or body composition or catabolism. And, uh, well, its anti-catabolic actions are seen mainly from intravenous administration. When it works on performance, it's, it's curious because it's usually administered with uh, also carbohydrates. I think the, the best evidence regarding glutamine is, is fairly recent. It's a clinical nutrition paper in 2018, and it states basically this. It has no effect on the immune system, no effect on body composition, and the, the only effect that you detect are, are basically due to body fluid balance. It has no effect on gross hormone, no effect on creatine kinase or aerobic capacity. So these are, to the glutamine believers, really disappointing results. If it works, then it's mainly on clinical settings or in critical, critically ill patients. Why doesn't glutamine work? Well, in my view, and several papers have, have discussed this, it's because it's consumed by cells with a higher replication rate, like enterocytes or leukocytes. So glutamine is used as a nitrogen donor for nucleic acid synthesis in pretty much all cells and also used to produce urea in the liver. And additionally, kidneys also use it to produce urinary ammonia. So only a tiny amount really gets into the muscle. And to finish, a recent umbrella meta-analysis review on the therapeutic effects of glutamine also found some positive results. However, they acknowledge some limitations, and I will quote them. However, researchers must appreciate the positive results with caution in light of the fact that there exists statistically significant heterogeneity for the majority of meta-analysis and statistically significant publication bias in almost half. So, if it works, maybe on gut permeability, on some extreme, extreme cases of prolonged endurance exercise, or like previously stated on criti critically ill patients, and uh, maybe here, and I don't see a reason by, why healthy young athletes would benefit uh, from glutamine supplementation outside these two uh, scenarios. 
those are lots of maybes for such a high prevalence of consumption among athletes. And uh, Philip, since you've talked about the retention and the fact that it doesn't get into the muscle, what uh, retention in the enterocytes are we talking about? What percentage of glutamine stays there? Uh, probably 50%. I think it has been shown. The, the issue is when, when glutamine gets into the enterocyte, all uh, cells with high activity in, in replication uh, like glutamine, like Stu said, and the, the enterocyte will retain between 40 and 50%. And then when you get the, the amino acid into the, the portal vein system, a lot of leukocytes will also withdraw a lot of glutamine. And then the organs will withdraw the glutamine, liver will, will withdraw glutamine. Everybody wants glutamine and not much gets into the muscle. A, a tiny amount gets into the muscle. So it's not sufficient to uh, get an effect. And uh, most of the arguments when people recommend glutamine, they say, well, see the study, glutamine does this, glutamine does that, exercise reduces glutamine. Okay, but that's endogenously produced glutamine, not supplemented glutamine. Okay, perfect. Um, Stuart, is there anything you would like to add? No, I, I think uh, Philippe did a nice job summarizing what, what, what we know out there. And, and, and again, I, I think that people, um, you know, uh, everybody needs to do their own experiment. But uh, if you want to use uh, evidence-based practice, then the ultimate, uh, I think, test on this is, is really that um, the, the, the net effect is, if it's there, is pretty small with the supplement. But um, You know, we need to do some some better work with the with the gastrointestinal permeability uh, issue, which I think is maybe something where glutamine could could show some some benefit for sure. Okay, the research performed by Dr. Jamie Puke, uh, he was here on the podcast, and he also admitted that those were preliminary results, and much more research is needed on the subject. And so we move on to a supplement that is quite trendy among athletes now, and it seems to uh, point out the notion of muscle recovery has gone from simply considering the muscle tissue uh, to include ligaments and tendons as well. Um, and I'm of course talking about collagen supplementation and it started to have more attention, at least I think, since a research from Dr. Gregory Shaw and Dr. Keith Barr entitled Vitamin C Enriched Gelatin Supplementation Before Intermittent Activity Augments Collagen Synthesis. And uh, we were talking about this early today when a, a Portuguese colleague of ours was pointing out an interview from a performance nutritionist working with a Premier League soccer team saying, and I quote, one thing we have uh, used a lot of recently are collagen shots. There is a lot of emerging research on those. Uh, they have proved to be very popular with players. There is an element of convenience with those. Instead of having to take a 500 milliliters protein shake, uh, they just have to take 60 millimeter shot. So it's more convenient for them uh, and they are getting the benefit of the collagen itself. So this may be the case that athletes or even sports nutritionists are recommending athletes to take collagen instead of taking protein shake. So with this context in mind, what is the amino acid profile of collagen? How efficient is the absorption of this uh, collagen peptides and subsequent incorporation in the human matrix? Is there any effect of supplementing with collagen or including this uh, vitamin C enriched gelatin in the athlete's diet or it's some typical form of which Wishful thinking, Stuart. Yeah, so um, I think three things to make very clear. Uh, first of all, uh, collagen, where you know where it comes from. I mean, it is um, it's a quote unquote a, a throwaway protein that comes from hydrolysis of uh, things like bones and and feathers that are left over from uh, animal processing, or or it comes from the skin of animals. So just so we're all clear, where that where the source is. Um, the collagen peptides that are generally sold in sports supplement products are, are very water soluble. So you can put a lot into solutions. So as you said, you can get them into shot forms, but the protein itself is deficient in the essential amino acid tryptophan. So it has a quality score of zero. So it's, it's not actually a, a complete protein. But, you know, even if you want to gloss over that, um, then the, the key point from a muscle regeneration standpoint is that it's an extraordinarily, um, in terms of its content, low in leucine, which, you know, as we've said before, is the key amino acid to stimulating protein synthesis. 
And so it does nothing for muscles. So to say that, you know, you're getting benefit post-exercise when you take this as opposed to drinking a big shake is not true for a muscle. No, so let's switch over and talk about connective tissue. Collagen is the most abundant protein in the body. So I don't want to dismiss the fact that its repair or regeneration is something that athletes need to pay attention to. Uh, the main point being that, uh, you know, it's predominantly composed of non-essential amino acids, in particular glycine. And the theory is then, or the the hypothesis that's put forward by collagen protein companies is that you know collagen contains the amino acids that you need to repair collagen and and it makes the assumption that the amino acids themselves are in some sort of rate limiting quantity and that if you didn't drink collagen or get collagen peptides that you would have insufficient amino acids to make those connective tissue proteins and i don't know that anybody's shown that convincingly what i will say is that we're doing some work uh, with collagen and we use it as a as a placebo because it's isonitrogenous and isoenergetic by comparison to you know whey protein in a lot of cases and from a muscle standpoint and all kinds of other things that, that i won't talk about now because I'll, I'll, I'll spoil somebody's paper in a few months um we don't see anything so uh i i, I know keith um, and, and I know Greg Shaw and, you know, I've, I've spoken to them about the work. I think what's important to realize is that bone is by 50 percent by content collagen protein. So when when you look at their data and it's very interesting, don't get me wrong, the rise in all of these ostensibly anabolic markers of, of collagen proteins could arise because they're just blood markers from any collagenous tissue in the body. And it's um, it's following a skipping an episode of skipping. And so that's essentially a very powerful um, stimulus, actually, for bone protein synthesis. So, you know, people say, oh, it's, you know, what do you think of Dr. Shaw's and Dr. Barr's tendon work? And I said, well, we don't know that it's a tendon. In fact, if I had money to bet, I'd, I would say that a lot of that response is actually coming from from bone. So when people ask me about, you know, collagen protein and uh, they talk about, what do you do? I, I, I always say it's a fairly low risk activity. And um, so it's worth, you know, maybe giving it a try and seeing what happens. But don't expect that magic. Yeah. Before we switch to, to Philippe uh, Stewart, I would still ask you, could we perhaps obtain the same results? Uh, I don't know. We, we are talking about... Uh, Taking collagen, taking it out of its matrix, taking out all the amino acids, absorbing them. And the idea is that they will be further incorporated in our own uh, collagen matrix. Couldn't we do the exact same effect with consuming protein or to consuming whey protein as well? Uh, exactly. I mean, uh, you know, you're, you're 100 percent correct. And I mean, let's again, you know, a quick lesson in biochemistry is that, you know, there are 20 amino acids. Um, nine of them are essential and the other 11 are, quote unquote, non-essential. So in other words, we can make them. Um, a lot of people believe based on some factorial analyses methods, and I've seen people use this on social media, uh, and it's, it's wrong. Um, but, you know, just to be clear, we're somehow deficient in glycine. And, and in other words, is that our bodies just can't make enough to keep up with demand. Um, and that, you know, that research has been done and it's really old, but you have to go and look at it. And when you look at the flux rates and the turnover of proteins that contain glycogen that, or glycogen, excuse me, glycine. Glycine, they're, they're not limited by glycine. So, uh, you know, it's a little bit of a false notion to say that uh, somehow collagen protein is limited by the provision of the amino acids that are present in collagen. It seems like it's a, it's a really trite marketing um, sort of stick, if you like, um, to say, you know what, you, if you want to make collagen, you should eat collagen because, you know, that's where we get the, the right amino acid profile. And people talk about things like hydroxyproline and hydroxylysine in collagen. And, um, you know, that's not even a usable amino acid. So I'm not really sure I understand the, the rationale behind that. Philip, your turn. Sorry for cutting your turn here. What is your take on collagen? I would say that collagen to increase muscle protein synthesis is for sure not the best option. 
And uh, regarding tendons, the, the question regarding the Greg Shaw's paper is, from where comes this increased collagen? So is it bone, tendon? We don't really know. So I would prefer to wait for more research before recommending collagen to enhance tendon repair. It's definitely interesting, but also I think there's a paper out of Stu's lab in elderly folks that compared collagen to way, isn't it Stu? I yeah, yeah. It. I mean, I didn't, I didn't bring it up because it, you know most people just sort of say, oh, it's, um, it's old people, so it's not relevant. But um, you know, it, it, it shows the concept pretty clearly in my mind. Philip, what can you add to this party? Yeah. So again, the the, the big issue with the, with this paper from from uh, Dr. Gregory Shaw and uh, Dr. Keith Barr is from where is the collagen coming from? Coming from? It's been measured, but you can't track it down. Is it a tendon, a ligament? Uh, is it bone, like Stu said? We don't know. So that should be that has to be cleared up. And uh, again, if we hydrolyze collagen, 100% hydrolyzed collagen, and we use those amino acids and we compare it with partially hydrolyzed collagen, would we see a difference? I don't know if any study compared this. Maybe Stu knows. Uh, I'm not an expert on collagen. But is there any papers, too, that you're aware of where hydrolyzed collagen is compared with its free amino acid content? No, not, not that I'm aware of. So this would be something like glycine. It should be the argument here for, for tendon, uh, the, the glycine content. So I think there's a lot. I've seen people using collagen to, to enhance and to, to improve and to speed up recovery and, and injuries, but I'm not sure if that's the... I think we need more and more evidence at this point. And I believe that uh, uh, Professor Keith Barr's lab should be uh, producing more evidence soon. Hmm. Allow me to put some gasoline into the fire. Uh, about beef protein, is there a way that beef protein action or a lack of action would act by the same mechanism as collagen, Stuart? Uh, yes. So far as I, I mean, you know, beef protein is a complete protein. So I think the important difference would be is that beef protein is giving you all of the other essential amino acids that you would need anyway. So I, I don't know that it's directly comparable to, to, to collagen, but it, it, you know, it may certainly, because of you know, the, the collagen content of, of beef protein, it may have uh, a slightly different amino acid profile. I mean, I, I'm quite confident there was a paper that just came out in Nutrients where it was people from Jolita had looked at uh, sort of, quote unquote, diluting, if you like, whey protein using collagen. So you could essentially lower the protein content of whey by adding collagen back to it and to the point where the whey collagen blend would essentially still provide all of the essentials in, in, in an adequate quantity. So, you know, maybe that's a sort of a, a future uh, look at this, but beef protein in my mind then would be sort of the same kind of thing, but maybe with uh, a few less of the essentials than whey protein. So I, I think it's a little bit different, to be honest with you. So kind of the poor cousin of whey and the rich cousin of collagen. Philippe, what are your thoughts on beef protein? Uh, well, uh, beef protein has collagen and, and it is a complete protein like egg. Would the content of collagen in beef protein matter for tendon repair? I'm honestly not sure. <laughs> Definitely more research is required there. Okay, perfect. Interesting insights to, to take into account. And now, Philippe, uh, it's your time to shine. Uh, from collagen, we go to our last supplement. We go to leucine metabolites, uh, from which HMB might be more familiar to our uh, listeners. Uh, I would say that it's less popular in the endurance world. And uh, a month ago, just as I said in the beginning of the episode, I had the pleasure to attend to Philippe's PhD uh, thesis dissertation. HMB supplementation and other leucine metabolites effect on uh, of several parameters such as body composition, resistance exercise performance and even more recently on muscle inflammation so philip could you please summarize for us the tale of hmb supplementation how it all began how did you come up to study this particular uh, leucine metabolites and what were the main outcomes from your research okay uh so uh, my research was performed due to the extraordinary results from uh, kramer wilson and and laurie et al papers 
I thought that directly comparing these different forms of HMB, so the, the free acid form and the calcium salt form, would be interesting. We also decided to further investigate alpha ICA due to the Meruet al. paper in 2010. Uh, we actually found no effect on muscle sickness, anabolic hormones, proxy markers of muscle damage like creatine kinase, body composition measured by DEXA, and of course exercise induced inflammation. Uh, our results have been confirmed by other research groups like the Jakubowski out of Stu's lab and also more recently by the Trito et al. paper. So in my view, when consuming sufficient protein and in an estimated positive energy balance, it makes no sense to supplement with HMB or alpha ICA. This is not surprising in, in my view, uh, since uh, Wilkins, the Wilkinson et al. papers, both papers from 2013 and 2015, had shown no differences in muscle protein synthesis between both forms of HMB. So from our research, no leucine metabolite was better than placebo. Furthermore, um, HMB calcium doesn't seem better than leucine. This has been shown uh, f from the Josie Jakubowski paper. And the confirming our results, uh, the Trito et al. paper also found no effect uh, of either form of HMB when comparing with placebo. Uh, I would like to stress out that HMB and Alphic are leucine derivatives and that we are really discussing here in our different affinities to Cestrin 2, which is related to mTOR. So, these molecules are just slightly different than leucine. We're talking about uh, decarboxylation and deamination in both molecules, both HMB and alpha -ic. How about in endurance athletes? Would you believe that it would have any effect at all? Well, few papers have covered HMB in, in endurance performance. The, the Vukovic paper in 2001 found some effects on time to reach VO2 peak. Uh, furthermore, uh, Lambole in 2007 showed the increased VO2 max. Robinson in 2014 with HMB free acid showed an increase in VO2 peak, but no changes in time to exhaustion. Uh, the O'Connor and Crow papers, both in 2003 and 2007, uh, found no effect uh, of HMB calcium on, on, anaerobic, uh, on aerobic capacity and endurance. And more recently, uh, Angela Miramonti in 2016 um, showed uh, an increased onset of neuromuscular fatigue, but this was actually uh, performed from the same cohort as the Robinson et al. paper in 2014. The, the question in my view is, if HMB improves endurance and VO2 to a certain extent, what is the mechanism involved? And I don't want extrapolations from cell studies or from animal research. I want plausible mechanism duly validated in humans. So that's my thing. Not a lot of papers. And uh, what is the mechanism? What is the, what is the plausible mechanism by which HMB could increase endurance performance and perhaps have a positive effect on uh, oxygen consumption? Stuart, would you say that the studies that you and Philippe published in his uh, PhD research have put a nail in the coffin in HMB supplementation? <laughs> I, I'm, I, I never really am certain that anything is a nail in the coffin these days. And, and Philippe and I have exchanged enough emails, you know, when we when we see other data that are out there. But I think that um, I think that uh, the, the study that uh, that Philippe performed and with our study uh, with Josie Jakubowski, I mean, it really does call into question some of the previous data, particularly given uh, these extraordinarily robust effects facts, as uh, Philippe said, that were observed in, in other studies. And, and I think, interestingly, when people draw back and, and look at the meta-analyses and just appreciate that uh, HMB is controlled by uh, a single company on a global basis and run through Metabolic Technologies Incorporated in the United States, um, and really, you can't get the supplement uh, unless you're going to do research that ostensibly would support their cause. Uh, and yet meta-analyses show that the effects with, uh, with HMB are uh, small, if not uh, non-existent. So, and, and, you know, that I think says an awful lot when given the amount of time that HMB has been around. Um, and, I, and I always explain to people that HMB is a metabolite of leucine. So uh, I'm not certain why people would expect for it to be so much more potent uh, in its effects than, than leucine per se, appreciating that leucine has lots of other metabolic fates that, that HMB does not. 
and that HMB might stick around for a little bit longer, how, you know, have a longer half-life, but um, they signal through the same pathways. They, they trigger essentially the same mechanisms. Um, so I, a nail in the coffin, I'm <laughs> not sure, but certainly it calls to question some of the research that's there. Okay, let's hope our listeners take those important insights into account when considering supplementing with uh, HMB. And uh, on another topic, considering that uh, cycling athletes often compete until quite late in their lives, we have, for example, master athletes um, in categories up to uh, 75 years old, and taking into account that increased uh, anabolic resistance in older people and consequently in older riders may occur, could we perhaps assume that protein requirements should be higher in these athletes? Should any of the supplements that we have been discussing so far be considered in this population, Stuart? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's an interesting question. And, and to your point about uh, older athletes, I mean, you know, we traditionally observe that older people, not necessarily athletes, are more what we call anabolically resistant. So in other words, uh, at a given dose of protein, they're not able to mount the same protein synthetic response as the younger counterparts. Um, we're pretty sure that if you're active, you can sustain some of that, uh, if you like, youth full response, but probably there's an aging program that takes over that, you know, would even uh, suggest that even, you know, extreme amounts of activity uh, are unable to result in preservation of muscle mass. And I mean, you only have to look at a few um, masters athletes to, to notice that they, they do, they, they lose muscle um, just, just like everybody else, maybe a little bit slower rate, but uh, not appreciably so. Um, so I think for older masters, uh, uh, particularly endurance and resistance athletes, then the, the recommendations around increased protein would be uh, even more important. Hmm. Philippe, uh, taking into account what we were talking about in the first question, the timing, the quality, uh, the fractioning, would you say that these athletes may need to take into account all of these particular aspects in protein uh, recommendations? Well, uh, maybe they do not need to increase protein intake if they are healthy and active. The, the paper out of Professor Black Rasmussen's lab covers this a bit. Uh, in my view, it is not clear where this anabolic resistance comes from. It's there. Uh, people lose muscle mass when they get older. But is it a normal physiological consequence of aging or is it related with the onset of diseases and inactivity? Well, my guess my guess would be that all three are involved. Okay, interesting insights. Um, and what final advice would you give athletes from all sports and even to sports nutritionists in terms of superior cost-benefit approaches to take into account when looking to maximize recovery or reduce exercise-induced muscle damage or even muscle soreness before considering the supplements we'll be talking about, Stuart? Yeah, so I mean, really briefly in summary, like I, I think that a food first approach is is a great way to go. Uh, food, uh, first of all, I mean, you've got a lot of other nutrients that come along in food uh, that you need anyway. Um, and an athlete should strive to get as much of their, their energy covered by, uh, you know, real foods that they eat and, you know, with the health message to probably avoid uh, as much as they can sort of processed foods. And, you know, that goes for everybody, it seems. Um, and then, you know, supplements are, are convenience. And if you can't uh, get the food at the time that you need it or you can't transport it or you simply can't uh, stomach eating the volume of food, then, then supplements really are uh, a sort of a fallback position. Uh, they can be useful in extreme situations and, uh, you know, but don't switch to, you know, uh, all supplement uh, at, at the expense of food. I think that that's a, that's a big mistake a lot of athletes fall into. Uh, and then in the end, I always ask athletes when they say is, is this supplement better than, you know, this food or what should I do? And my first question is always, how much money do you have in your pocket? Because supplements tend to be more expensive than food. So that might be a consideration. And then uh, after that, I, I say, how much do you care about the impact that nutrition might make? And if it's just the average gym goer, then uh, I'm less worried about their nutrition than I am about somebody who might be trying to sit on the podium in Tokyo uh, next year. 
Yeah, such an important point. And people often don't think about this cost-benefit approach on how much money they have to spend. Uh, what else would you add to this, uh, Philippe? What advice would you give to athletes and sports nutritionists out there? Uh, like Stu said, foot-first approach is always better. Uh, so to maximize post-exercise recovery and to maintain or enhance subsequent exercise performance, I think targeting an optimal ingestion of both carbohydrate and protein should be the main focus. Regarding uh, supplements to inhibit muscle damage and inflammation, a couple of notes here. First of all, it does not seem a good idea to chronically inhibit muscle damage and inflammation. However, some supplements seem promising in this regard when inflammation and muscle damage are out of control. The question is, what is the threshold where we consider that inflammation and damage are out of control? Still, if someone is, is focused on uh, inhibiting uh, inflammation and muscle damage, there are some supplements that are promising, like blackcurrant juice, tart cherry, I think it's very promising, perhaps supplementing it up to seven days uh, before a stressful event. Bromelain, pomegranate, uh, likely to uh, to be interesting. Of course, omega-3 uh, caffeine has been proposed due to its analgesic effects. Now, this is important. Supplements with more evidence to recover are not new. From endurance exercise, maybe beetroot juice is, is the best option. And for uh, resistant exercise training, maybe creatine. So nothing new, I'm sorry, but these seem to be the best options. I'm sorry, nothing extraordinary, but it's what we have. Totally agree. Uh, we are still giving too much attention to the secondary stuff and much less attention to what should be primary, which is uh, the food, of course. And try to uh, find a nutritionist that makes you save money and not a nutritionist that makes you spend even more money. Um, so, guys, um, we have reached the end of our interview. Um, if people want to know more about your uh, the, the research you're doing or keeping up with your updates, uh, Stuart, where can people find you i am uh, mac kin prof that's m-a-c-k-i-n-p-r-o-f on twitter um uh, that's probably where i spend most of my social media time i'm also on facebook s-n-p-p-h-d um and you can find me on both platforms I, i'm also mac kin prof on instagram although i'm a terrible instagram poster Mainly because I hate taking pictures of, uh, especially myself. Okay, I can confirm that uh, Stuart is quite active on Twitter. And as I heard on another podcast, uh, there is another Stuart Phillips out there, isn't there? There is a hairdresser, right? <laughs> he's, he's an extraordinarily famous and apparently very good hairdresser. Yeah, I, 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 at some point, I need to visit my alter ego. He's somewhere in London, so uh, maybe one day I will. <laughs> Okay, but in case you find it, uh, make sure it's not the hairdresser and it is yeah. the <laughs> it's Stuart, uh, the professor. Um, yeah, if I'm saying something about exercise, that's generally the key. If I'm showing pictures of uh, great haircuts I've given, that's not okay. Me. <laughs> that seems like a good way to 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 make the difference. Uh, how about you, Philip? Well, I think the, the, the Stuart Phillips that is a, a hairdresser has the, I think it's the Guinness record for the most expensive haircut in the world. <laughs> oh, I, I've, I've read that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so so it's, I think he's, he's also likes to, uh, a, a very successful uh, person too. You can find me on Facebook and on Instagram, although I'm not very active there. And I'm still, I'm, I'm Philippe Teixeira underscore nutrition. I'm also on Twitter, but I have no idea of how that works. I'm, I'm trying to learn with Stu, but uh, I'm still uh, far from understanding it. Okay, you can start by uh, searching for Stuart Phillips, the hairdresser, and uh, then you can see where it goes from there. Um, I, I believe the hairdresser, that he has the most expensive uh, haircuts because he might add uh, collagen to his uh, hairdressing, maybe. <laughs> maybe a possibility. Yeah. Let's stick with that. <laughs> Uh, so I will make sure to add your uh, your contacts to the show notes. Uh, I would just like to thank you again for your time. I believe we we covered everything, and let's hope our listeners uh, took some really important insights on this uh, subject. So thank you, Stu. My pleasure. And thank you, Philip. 
uh, thank you for this talk, Gabriel. Uh, it was also a pleasure to be with Stu again. Uh, he was my mentor during my PhD, and I owe him a lot. We, we performed some uh, good research, in my view. It was a, a real uh, learning experience, and thank you to you both, gentlemen. Philip, it has been a pleasure having you here, my friend. Muito obrigado pelo teu tempo. Many thanks for your time, Philip, and hope to talk to you soon, gentlemen. Many thanks. So that was it for today's episode with Dr. Stuart Phillips and Dr. Philippe Teixeira. I truly hope you took many important notes from this talk. Particularly, I hope that many of you now have more criteria when choosing to supplement or not. Thank you for listening in and I hope to have you guys here again on the next episode. Bye bye.